Hi, and welcome back to Sunday Seminary Online. I'm Brennan Breed, and uh, in this video, we'll, we'll, we will talk about the letter to the Galatians. So Paul's epistle to the Galatians, uh, a, uh, a rollicking one, a fiery one. Uh, as much as 1 Thessalonians was a letter of Paul expressing overflowing admiration and joy and love for uh, the Thessalonian uh, followers of Jesus, um, the, the letter to the Galatians is full of invective and uh, uh, really angry rhetoric from Paul. Uh, if you have read through it, uh, if you noticed, uh, Paul um, uh, is upset uh, throughout and uh, adopts uh, some of the uh, ancient Greco-Roman uh, practices of writing, um, including uh, the apologia, which imagines himself in a courtroom, um, in some way a defendant uh, being accused of things by the Galatians and by uh, other opponents. Um, we'll get to who those opponents are uh, in just a moment. But in any event, um, uh, yeah, the, Galatian, the letter to the Galatians is uh, central to uh, Christian understandings of who Paul is. But what I will say uh, in this video is that um, we need to understand the context of Paul's uh, uh, time with the Galatians and then also what happened after Paul left. Um, why is Paul writing this letter? Uh, because what Paul says about the law um, is, I think, highly dependent upon what the Galatians themselves are actually doing. That is, these people that Paul is writing to. Um, so what is uh, Galatia? Where is Galatia? Um, well, Galatia is a, a province. It was a Roman province um, in uh, Asia Minor, what is today uh, Turkey. Uh, this was uh, occupied by uh, Greek-speaking people, but uh, Greek-speaking people who themselves um, had, uh, at least many of them, had um, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. And so the, the Galatians, um, if you refer to someone as Galatians, which Paul does in this letter uh, in chapter 3, refers to them as Galatians, um, uh, that would... Uh, bring up an ethnic identity. Um, uh, so these were these would have been people related to the Gauls um, uh, in terms of their language and culture and ethnicity and so on. So um, these were uh, uh, Celtic people, um, tribal tribal Celtic people uh, who became integrated with the, uh, the the Roman Empire. And you can see in this map here. Um, so this is Asia Minor uh, and Paul's travels. Paul uh, uses uh, Antioch as a base for a little while and then gets in a fight, of course, with some Christian leaders, including uh, Cephas as he calls him, or Peter, um, uh, at Antioch, um, and uh, kind of abandons Antioch uh, as, a, as a center for him, uh, but travels up, and here's Tarsus, by the way, where Paul is often associated with, according to the book of Acts, but we're not exactly sure. He doesn't talk about it himself. Um, but this region of Galatia here, at least northern Galatia, is very rural, and that was home to the actual Galatian people. Um, southern Galatia um, was not actually technically part of uh, the, the ethnic homeland of the Galatians. Um, this was uh, settled by uh, Greek and Roman people um, yeah, and included uh, big cities like Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, uh, Lystra, and Derbe. Um, and uh, uh, Paul seems to spend a lot more time in these cities according to Acts um, in, the, in the southern part of Galatia. Um, and these people would have been um, very much normal Roman in, uh, inhabitants of the Roman Empire. Um, whereas the northern Galatians, uh, these these would have been kind of unusual people within the Roman Empire um, in a much more rural area. Uh, today, Ankara, the capital of Turkey, uh, is in this area, but, but back then it was um, a very rural uh, space. Um, I think that uh, uh, Paul uh, writes this letter to the northern Galatians because, number one, he refers to these people as Galatians, which wouldn't have made a whole lot of sense um, if you were writing to, to people in uh, the city of, say, Iconium. Um, uh, they would have referred to themselves, I mean, as Greeks or um, as uh, residents of Iconium, citizens of Iconium. Um, but uh, when Paul calls them Galatians, that seems to suggest that they are uh, ethnically Galatian. Uh, but also Paul uh, talks about getting sick um, in chapter 4. He says he's kind of like uh, waylaid and, and these people took care of him. Um, this seems to suggest that this might have been kind of part of Paul's journeys where he wasn't actually trying to... Uh, uh, speak to the Galatians. Uh, in Acts chapter 15, it suggests that Paul might have been traveling through Galatia, um, that is this northern part of the province of Galatia, the, the actual homeland of the Galatian people. He got waylaid, uh, perhaps according to Galatians 4.13, gets sick, and the people there take care of him, and then he, he witnesses to them, uh, pre preaches them the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, after that, he leaves, uh, moves on, and continues his, his uh, ministry in other places. Um, and then uh, later on gets a report that these uh, uh, Galatian uh, uh, followers of Jesus 
um, these Gentiles there, have uh, begun to uh, hear a new gospel, a different kind of gospel. And uh, what Paul is at pains to say is there's only one gospel, uh, and that's the gospel that I gave you. So in any event, that seems to be the kind of setting um, and background for this. Um, there's some debate, some some biblical scholars will say this is written to the Southern Galatians. It doesn't really matter all that much in, in particular. Um, uh, so, but anyway, there, there's, there are some, some good uh, discussions um, in biblical scholarship, and Brigitte Call, a uh, New Testament scholar, up at uh, Union Seminary in New York City um, has a really interesting article on the those uh, sculptures of the dying Gauls, um, uh, this kind of heroic, uh, passionate um, uh, uh, way that the Romans thought about the Gauls. Uh, in, in anyway, they may, may have something to do with their with with. The, the depiction of the Galatians uh, in the letter of the Galatians, but we'll say that for another day. So the letter to the Galatians, dated sometime between 49 and 54. It depends on how you reconstruct Paul's journeys based on Acts um, and uh, where these where they where they relate one to another. Um, I mean, I'm I'm guessing that this is uh, uh, Paul's second letter. That's why I've um, uh, chronologically his second letter that's that's preserved in the New Testament, um, which is why I've uh, uh, put it here. But we don't really know exactly. Um, next uh, session we'll talk about uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, and then the second letter to the Corinthians. Um, and uh, y if, when we get to that, you'll see that uh, in terms of content, Second Corinthians, especially uh, chapters um, uh, ten through thirteen, uh, those look a lot like Galatians in terms of Paul's anger. Um, but uh, the content of Galatians in terms of the law um, and, and Paul's uh, conversation about the law seems to have a lot in, in common with Romans. So Romans might be written in a way uh, to counteract some of his theology in Galatians that can be taken the wrong way, or at least uh, that might be um, understood in ways that Paul didn't like. So in any event, it's somewhere, somewhere around there in that, in that period um, after 1 Thessalonians and before Romans. So uh, again, written to Galatia, this uh, Roman province in Asia Minor, or what we would call today Turkey, uh, and angry like Second Corinthians, uh, but at issue in terms of the content of it, uh, yeah, it's about Jewish identity um, and how do followers of Jesus who are Gentiles understand and relate to Jewish identity and uh, the, that core central aspect of Jewish identity, the law of Moses. Okay, so uh, let's turn to, to, to the letter to the Galatians. Um, and uh, uh, we'll start here with the uh, the salutation. Now, you remember how letters, Greco-Roman letters, are supposed to start, right? They start with the sender and the addressee. So here we go, Paul and Apostle. Surprising because this is one of only two letters that we think are um, uh, original to Paul that are in the New Testament, uh, which uh, uh, begin without multiple people being named. Uh, so Paul here writes in his own name by himself. Uh, the only other letter from him like this is uh, the letter to the Romans. Um, so we'll see for the Corinthians um, next week, uh, the letter to the Corinthians, um, that this is a bit different. So Paul, an apostle, and notice that he's calling himself an apostle here. Paul, an apostle, but an apostle designated by who? Sent neither by human commission, nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Uh, now, apostle is kind of like a, a emissary, an, an ambassador. He's an ambassador, but sent not by a human, uh, nor from human authorities, but by Jesus. And this is linked to Paul's claim later on in this uh, letter. Um, that is, he had a vision of Jesus, and Jesus himself sent and commissioned Paul and gave him the gospel. He didn't get this gospel from human people. Uh, so, through Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the members of God's family who are with me. So, uh, and one other thing, uh, you can remember that, that language of brothers and sisters in Thessalonians, a very important part of Paul's message um, uh, throughout all of Paul's letters uh, is that we are a family. Uh, that is that Christian people and Christian uh, uh, followers of Jesus, um, right? He didn't use the word Christian, but followers of Jesus are part of a family. Uh, and this, you know, not all um, religions of the ancient world understood uh, the other followers to be parts of a family. Uh, but this family rhetoric, this family language uh, and metaphors are very, very important to Paul. We'll get back to those uh, as well um, uh, in future letters. So uh, Paul is saying that Jesus, the Christ, right, Jesus, the Messiah, and God, the Father, who raised Jesus from the dead, are the ones who sent and commissioned Paul and gave him the gospel message. This is going to be really important because Paul is going to be arguing with people he says has a different have a different message. So this is in, so that's the sender and then the addressee to the churches of Galatia. And this is again part of the province or the ethnic homeland. And I'm I'm arguing it's part of the ethnic homeland uh, to the northern rural Galatian churches that are filled with Galatian people. Uh, grace to you and peace 
from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember, this is uh, Paul's uh, uh, twist on the um, uh, typical Roman greeting of basically greetings, um, karen, uh, and he's changing that to charis or grace, and then adding uh, the traditional uh, Hebrew greeting of uh, shalom or in, in Greek, peace, uh, irene, uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember Lord, kind of boss in a way, um, boss Jesus, the Messiah, um, who gave himself for our sins and set us free from the present evil age. And this is going to be a part of uh, the Galatians, an interesting, important part of the letter. What did Jesus do? What did Jesus set us free from? Uh, now notice Paul's not saying that Jesus set us free from the law um, or did away with the law, uh, abolished the law, etc. Um, uh, it, 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 sometimes Christians talk about it like that, but uh, in the letter to the Galatians, it's a bit different. It's that, it's that the law doesn't really apply and never really has applied to these Gentile uh, people. Um, but what did, uh, what did Jesus actually set us free from? If, if this is being addressed to Gentile people um, who have, uh, you know, just like the first letter of 1 Thessalonians, and that's what we imagine, they're Gentile people being addressed here. Um, God has set us free through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the present evil age. Um, that is that there are powers in this world that are trying to get us. And uh, Paul in Galatians calls these the stoicheia, referring to uh, these kind of uh, evil powers. Uh, um, you can think of them as principles, like almost like physical principles of the world. But, but really often if they're referred to as kind of like evil spirits or, or powers that can like, uh, and in Greek culture, these would have been kind of like um, uh, not necessarily evil spirits, but kind of powers that, spiritual powers that energize and run the world. Uh, to Paul, these are evil powers um, that, that are fighting against God uh, and uh, that have, uh, uh, in a way, captured uh, many of the peoples of the world um, and that this is what Jesus sets us free from. So that's this, this is his greeting and then, uh, you know, to whom be glory forever and ever and amen. Uh, so may you have grace and peace. This is our greeting and our blessing. And then if you remember our good uh, uh, letter writing formulas from the ancient world, just like in First Thessalonians, then we're supposed to have this Thanksgiving. And remember in Thessalonians, it was this really long, overflowing, beautiful, never ending uh, Thanksgiving for how great these people are. Uh, let's, let's turn to his Thanksgiving here uh, in uh, Galatians 1 verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who are confusing you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Hmm. I mean, it's this exceptionally uh, over-the-top um, refusal uh, to give a thanksgiving right here. Uh, in, in fact, we're turning immediately to, to, to the body of the letter, which is... Uh, a, a, an angry um, uh, invective, uh, an, an angry attack on the Galatians uh, for what they have done. That is that they have abandoned the principles that Paul has uh, given them and they've instead uh, followed after another gospel. Not that there is another gospel, right? Uh, but this fake thing that's, uh, be, that's being proclaimed as the gospel. And now instead of a blessing here, look at what you get in verse 8. That even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to what we proclaim to you, let that one be accursed. As we have said before, so now I now repeat, if anyone proclaims to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that one be accursed. Um, this is put in very nice language here uh, in the NRSV, and I'm sure your other translation, if you have one, says this very nicely, uh, accursed. Um, uh, really, Paul is uh, being, uh, he's not being very nice here. Uh, he, he is really saying a, a goddamn the person who would bring another gospel in here. Um, so that is to say, uh, instead of a blessing, you have a curse. Now, that is not to say that uh, there is no blessing in the letter of the Galatians. Now, if you turn to the very end of Galatians, and we'll end this video by turning back to the end of Galatians, but if you turn to Galatians 6, Paul ends up writing these big big letters in his own hand. He's got a scribe who helps him to write and who probably fashions part of the, the content of these letters, by the way. Um, uh, uh, but Paul, at the end, takes over the pen and writes with his own hand and writes in big letters so they can't, uh, well, maybe because he's not very good at writing, but maybe also because uh, he really wants them to, to see uh, and not be able to ignore some of the messages he has here at the end. But um, but he does end uh, uh, with this uh, kind of blessing, you know, especially uh, chapter 6, verse 18, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and so on. Um, uh, but this uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 counter blessing and verse uh, uh, 16 uh, of chapter 6, as for those who will follow this rule, peace be upon them and mercy 
and upon the Israel of God. So uh, we'll get back to what he means by Israel of God in just a moment. But to say he ends with this blessing that peace be upon you, which is uh, the kind of thing that you're hoping to, to see at the beginning. Uh, and there is some kind of thanksgiving in a way um, at the end of the letter. So Paul gets back to this, um, although he leaves off of it for now. But he, this very beginning part where he says, you know, let these people be damned um, who are going to bring another uh, gospel in, 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 in here and try to give it to you, right? Um, Paul then moves directly into talking about himself uh, and his, uh, the here over here, it's kind of blurry and grainy, sorry, but here's a Caravaggio's um, uh, uh, the road to Damascus, um, and here's uh, uh, the conversion of, of Paul, uh, Saul into Paul. Again, those are uh, playing on really more of the book of Acts, uh, but we get uh, Paul's own depiction of what happened exactly and where Damascus fits into this. Um, doesn't seem to be a road to Damascus until quite maybe years after Paul ends up having his conversion according to the letter to the Galatians. But still, here's Paul's story. Paul uh, moves from saying, hey, there's other people here who have been giving you a different gospel. He doesn't really talk about who they are here uh, yet. Um, but then he moves into saying, um, you know, basically, who am I uh, and why would you believe my gospel? And from what Paul says and the way he gives his autobiography here, we can get a sense for what those other people are saying about him. What negative things are they saying about him and about and what other message are they giving? Um, we can tell that from Paul's defensiveness here. So for I want you to know, this is uh, chapter 1 verse 11, for I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. I, he says, I didn't get this from any person. For I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's really important for Paul that he didn't get this from a person. He got this from Jesus himself. Now, uh, what might some of the people be saying about Paul that wouldn't lead to Paul saying this? What they're saying is Paul wasn't with the disciples. We, we, all of us know it's part of the whole story of the, you know, in, in the Gospels, which weren't written yet, but we can, you know, all the, the, the source material for the Gospels was out there and around in, in oral form, probably some of it written. Um, none of it talks about Paul, right? Paul's not there. We all know that Paul wasn't there. Um, so Paul's a latecomer right? I mean, he doesn't really know the true gospel. Um, so verse 13 of chapter 1, you have heard no doubt of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently persecuting the church of God, and I was trying to destroy it. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my people of the same age, for I was far more zealous of the traditions of my ancestors. But when God, who had set me apart before I was born and called me through his grace, was pleased, pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might proclaim him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia. Now, this is a bit different than what we see in Acts, where Saul becomes Paul and then is cared for by other Christians and then ends up really learning um, uh, about the history of Christianity, you know, sort of the history of Jesus, the story of Jesus, and what the, the sort of a, a theology um, of the nascent uh, Jesus movement was. Uh, what Paul says here is, is that uh, God came out of the blue and revealed Jesus to me, and I didn't go to Jerusalem to learn from other people there. I, I went into the Arabian desert and then went to Damascus. Uh, this is kind of his Damascus road, this really long experience. Why, why did he go into Arabia? And then he says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. So Paul's saying, I had a long time to think about the gospel and to learn about the gospel, and I didn't even ever talk to any of these Jerusalem people about it. Um, he's obviously got a beef with the Jerusalem people. We'll get back to that in a minute. But then he goes and visits Cephas, or Peter, um, and stayed with him for 15 days. And of course, what are they talking about? The gospel, right? They're talking about Jesus. But, uh, but I did not see any other apostles except for James, the Lord's brother. And this seems to be Jesus's brother, James, um, perhaps the author of the letter of James, etc. We'll get to James later on. Um, uh, but in what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. And then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Uh, so in other words, um, a lot of uh, the, th this suggests to us that Paul's detractors who have come to Galatia, the Galatian churches, and who have preached a different message, they've seemed to sideline Paul and said, Paul's wrong. Uh, Paul probably uh, uh, is, is a latecomer. He, he probably brought you a, a half-baked gospel. He got it kind of mixed up, but he heard it from, you know, these people in Jerusalem, uh, but he didn't really get it all right, so let's set you right. Um, Paul seems to be saying, no, I got the full gospel from the very beginning, and it wasn't uh, like a, a half gospel given to me by somebody else, right? So Paul's message is a divine origin. Paul is a Jew, right? He's a, he, he says, I'm, I'm one of the, I'm, a, I'm the best Jew, best kind of Jew there, right? You know, uh, but he's, he's uh, um, uh, 
got all the credentials that a Peter would have or that anyone else would try to have who tries to say that uh, Jewish Christianity is better than any other form of, uh, of Jesus following, um, which Paul is, of course, uh, at, odds, uh, at odds with. Um, Paul then talks about his journey and his relationship with the Jerusalem establishment and so on as a way of uh, defending his own person, personal message, right? You know, what, what his personality and his uh, uh, claims to authority and his claims to having the message. Um, but so, then he says uh, that the peoples in Judea and around Jerusalem, uh, they, they didn't didn't really know him or recognize him very much uh, except to say, yeah, there's that guy that used to torment us and now now he's he's got the message too. Um so then he says he's got 14 years, chapter 2. Then after 14 years, now this is a way of dating Paul's uh, uh, message in a way and Paul's career. Uh, so if you try to date this to somewhere around, say, 52 or something, and then so you got 14 years subtracted from that and so on. So this is one of the, one of the, the, the ways to try to date this material. But in any event, uh, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem <clears throat> with Barnas, taking Titus along with me. Uh, and I went up in response to a revelation. So Titus is this guy who's not a Jew, um, who is a, a, a follower of Jesus. He's got the gospel. Um, so then I laid before them, though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, that is to say, people say, well, we we didn't hear Paul saying this stuff in Jerusalem. We, we didn't know. No one in Jerusalem knew that Paul was had this message to the Gentiles. Um, this is Paul saying, yeah, I, I wasn't out there screaming it in the streets of Jerusalem, but I talked about it in private with the leadership that the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles. So Paul says, I've been given this special gospel to give to the Gentiles. I got to let them know about their special role. So Paul's not called. He doesn't talk about himself as being called to talk to the Jews, which is a bit at odds with Acts, where Paul goes to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles once he's kicked out of the synagogue. Here he seems to suggest he understands his own vocation as being primarily, and not even primarily, solely to the Gentiles. Um, so then verse 3 of chapter 2, but even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. So what Paul's saying here is, beginning of my mission, I went and talked to the leaders in Jerusalem, and I gave them my, my understanding of the gospel, especially as it applies to the Gentiles. And Titus came with me, and he wasn't circumcised, and they didn't make him get circumcised. That is to say, they were okay with the idea that Gentiles could stay Gentiles after they understood the gospel of Jesus Christ and that they could be followers of Jesus Christ and still remain Gentiles in all of the ways the Gentiles look and appear and uh, the, their own ethnic laws that they follow. So then, verse 4, but because of false believers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus that might enslave us, we did not submit to them for even a moment so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. So there's some people who are upset with Paul's message that we see here and it becomes more clear later on. Verse 7, on the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the uncircumcised, this is a way of saying the Gentiles, Paul's got the message to the Gentiles, and then it says, and Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised. So Peter is going to the Jews, and Paul's going to the Gentiles. Division of labor, right? Uh, this right up here is uh, actually a, a tomb. It's an inscription or a, a carving uh, on a tomb from the early Roman church. It's got Peter over here on one side and then Paul on the other. Um, you'll often see them kind of like in early Christian art, hugging and kissing and so on um, each other, you know, greeting each other with a holy kiss and, you know, uh, uh, showing a lot of affection for each other. But actually that, that doesn't seem to have been the case. At first they had this division of labor where they uh, divided things out and everything was going fine. Um, but then verse 9, James and Cephas and John, who are acknowledged pillars of the church, so James the brother of Jesus, and then Cephas, Peter, and then John, um, were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me. They gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So again, the division. They asked the one thing we remember, the poor. That is uh, a collection. And then Paul talks about the collection to the poor or to the church, uh, the, the, the collection of believers in Jerusalem who seem to have been made mainly poor. Um, so that is Paul remembers this and talks about this a lot. So he took that really seriously. And he says, I was eager to do that anyway, um, uh, to, to take up a collection among the more wealthy churches of the, of the Greco-Roman world to bring it back to Jerusalem. But then, verse 11, Paul gets into this problem. Uh, then Cephas came to Antioch. Remember that Antioch, that, that uh, city, um, uh, Antioch of the Orantes. It's in today um, uh, southern Turkey. Uh, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. 
So the point here, and he gets into the story, and I won't read all of the story here, but you can read the next few verses. Um, and basically, Paul and Peter get into a fight because Peter begins to withdraw from the Gentiles and only eat at table fellowship with uh, Jews who have been circumcised or people who uh, have taken on the ethnic uh, and um, uh, religious uh, lives of, of Jews. Um, and and Paul says, how, how could this be? We've already come to this agreement that it's okay, just like you hung out with Titus before, before he got circumcised. It was totally okay for you uh, to spend time with Titus, and now you're rejecting Gentile people who are acting like Gentiles um, and who look like Gentiles and aren't circumcised like Gentiles. Um, that is to say, Paul's got this big problem um, with the way that Peter has uh, uh, gone back on his previous word. And uh, then there's this uh, a dispute, right? And that's kind of where we end it. Um, that is to say, there's this, I t he tells off Peter. So Paul is saying, I, I got into a fight with the leadership in, in uh, the Jerusalem leadership, including Peter at Antioch, um, already about this. And I told them the truth about it. Um, and it's hypocritical for you to do this. So uh, there is an active dispute that Paul is admitting exists within the followers of the community, the followers of Jesus, uh, over the status of Gentiles and their inclusion within the community. What do Gentiles have to do with respect to the Jewish law? Especially circumcision, that, that, that fundamental foundational mark of inclusion within the Jewish community. Um, you might think to yourself, this isn't that big of a deal. I mean, who would care that much about this? Like, it's like baptism. Would you not let someone come to church because they haven't been baptized? Um, if we think about it uh, for, from Paul's perspective, um, for Paul, a lot hangs on this. Uh, Paul's understanding of what's been happening and his role in it is that God is about to change the times. Uh, that apocalyptic moment has come, and it's Paul's job to tell the nations that they are supposed to, like Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. If you haven't read it, pause the video, go read Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and then come back here. Paul's job is to share the message with the Gentiles that will bring them streaming to Jerusalem as Gentiles, as the nations. Uh, they're not supposed to be Jews. They're not supposed to be um, uh, ethnically Jews. And and uh, in, in a way, um, uh, the the gospel that that Paul has relies upon this, rests upon this. That's that's it's got to be what happens. Um, so. Can, can, you know, can Brennan breed an Irish, uh, you know, American guy? Um, can I be my full Irish American self and be accepted by Jesus? Uh, this is this is the, you know, can uh, my friend Alfred Appiah, um, a uh, uh, a Ghanaian Christian, can he be a full Ghanaian person and not have to change his ethnic identity, not have to change um, his uh, 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 practices of uh, inclusion in his own community uh, of like rights of adulthood, right? Can, do they can they can can Ghanaian people be full Ghanaian people and still be Christians and followers of Jesus and be accepted within this community and worship the God of Israel? And this is what Paul means at the very end of Galatians when he says, "The Israel of God, peace be upon those people who are part of the Israel of God, not 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 a flesh and blood um, Israel, uh, but uh, this nation." that is being built by God um, uh, that is now inclusive of, of Gentiles as well, fully inclusive of Gentiles. So it's really an issue of kind of inclusion and identity, um, uh, issues that are, of course, uh, uh, important topics for us to think about today uh, uh, in the United States. So uh, in any event, those are uh, a, a big, uh, big ideas um, uh, that we've got kind of out here. Uh, and you can see in a way that this has given us a, a, a good background for figuring out who the opponents of Paul are and what they are teaching. Um, Paul calls them the Judaizers, which they clearly didn't call themselves this. They called themselves, I don't know, uh, uh, messengers of the gospel of Jesus, uh, apostles like Paul did probably. Um, uh, but whoever, whoever came after Paul and began to teach them... Uh, probably said something like, oh, you didn't get the full gospel from Paul. You got a half gospel. Um, what Paul forgot to tell you, probably because he didn't have time or because he got the message garbled in translation, etc. Um, the real gospel is that once you've accepted Jesus, then you have to go and uh, follow the, the law. The, you have to learn the law and follow it and start with circumcision. You have to be kind of included in the community that way. Um, this uh, uh, this 
uh, it, it's a different way of thinking about the gospel, right? Um, and I, I want us to re remember that this wouldn't have sounded totally crazy to people back then, um, to Gentiles back then, because this was a movement that was started by a Jew, a Jew who didn't abandon the law, right? A Jew who didn't uh, reject the law, a Jew who remained a Jew to the very end, Jesus. Um, and then the early followers were all Jews who followed the law, like Peter. Um, Paul even follows the law most of the time. He says he gives it up when he has to, um, right? He's all things to all people. Um, uh, but Paul doesn't, this, this letter doesn't say the law is evil or that the law is bad. It just says that Gentiles don't need to follow it. In fact, if Gentiles think they have to follow it, they're probably doing something bad. Now, what Paul means by that, we'll get to later, and we'll actually get more into it in, uh, when we talk about Romans, because Paul comes back and clarifies some of his comments here. So we'll come back and uh, deal with all of this. Uh, okay, so uh, Paul's uh, argument then, uh, especially in chapter 3 uh, and into chapters 4 and 5, um, uh, revolves around an interpretation of Abraham. Uh, and really it revolves around an interpretation of Abraham uh, that has to do with Genesis 12, 1 through 3. So if you haven't read Genesis 12, 1 through 3, go ahead and pause the video, take a quick look at uh, Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and then come right back. Okay, so Genesis 12, 1 through 3 appears right after the Tower of Babel. Uh, this is, you know, God creates the world in Genesis 1. There's lots of problems with early humanity, right? Uh, you have the, the, the garden and the rebellion in Genesis 1, uh, 2 and 3. And then you have uh, Cain and Abel and so on and Lamech uh, in chapter 4 as well. He's kind of... Uh, issues of violence and uh, terror. Um, there's uh, human issues of human overstepping uh, that lead to the flood. Uh, the flood doesn't work to make humanity better. God accepts that humans are going to be bad. And then uh, uh, we get the Tower of Babel story uh, where people try to um, hold themselves together and God ends up pushing them apart and spreading them apart and creating the nations in a way. And the nations actually are kind of part of God's a blessing. Um, they're not a punishment. Uh, according to Genesis uh, 10 and 11, uh, God's idea was to spread the people out and create these different languages, that there would be confusion, but also that there would be um, uh, this kind of proliferation of humanity, part of the blessing that God gives in even Genesis uh, 1 and 2 and 3, um, that people would go out and fill the world. Um, uh, so in any event, all these different languages uh, are created. And so then what is God going to do now? Um, how is God going to fix the world? Uh, instead of, uh, like in the flood story, God tries to fix the whole world with one big thing, uh, one big action. In the Tower of Babel story, God's going to fix the whole world in one big action, but it doesn't actually work. Uh, so then Genesis 12, the story shifts, and from Genesis 12 all the way through to the end of Revelation, you can say, um, the rest of the Bible is about God trying to fix the world by, by working carefully and closely with one family over the course of millennia. It's a very different way of trying to fix the world than the flood story. So this is a pivotal moment in the Bible, pivotal moment for Paul in his understanding of, uh, of the Bible as well. Um, Genesis 12 is the beginning of God picking this one family to work on for a long, long, long period of time. Uh, it's, a, it's a shift in strategy, divine strategy, you might say. Uh, and the end point is the blessing of all of the families of the earth, that all the families of the earth may, may be blessed in you. That's why God is doing this with, with Abraham. And the message that the Judaizers seem to be giving uh, to the people is that uh, Abram, uh, uh, you know, ended up getting circumcised. And once Abram got circumcised, then all this kind of good stuff started to happen to the family. So you need to be circumcised too, just like Abram got, got circumcised. That's in Genesis 17. Uh, it's part of the giving of the covenant. Uh, what Paul ends up doing with, uh, with, with Abraham is saying, um, you know, he has a bunch of different arguments here. Uh, they seem to kind of address in turn at least six arguments that the Judaizers um, had argued against Paul's gospel in his absence. So Paul's responding here to all these arguments, and they're kind of like thrown together like grab bags. kind of hard to tell where they begin and end. But basically, uh, Paul is saying um, that uh, uh, Abram, and uh, he was called Abram in Genesis 12, right? He gets his name changed later. Um, but Abram, or Abraham, in Genesis 12, and Sarah um, are both told that they, through them, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And that happened before they got circumcised. So the blessing is given to people who haven't yet gone been circumcised. Uh, it's possible for you to not be circumcised and get this blessing. Now, the family of Abraham actually ends up getting circumcised, and then they go through this whole process of getting the law. But what Paul is saying is that that was a particular thing to their family. Uh, now we've come to a new point in history where the gospel of Jesus Christ is bringing in all of the nations, and we have a change. Just like we had a change in Genesis 12 in God's strategy, we have a change now with Jesus, death and resurrection, uh, and now the gospel going out to all the nations. That's a change in God's divine strategy. And that change is that uh, 
this moment has happened. The blessing has gone out to all the nations of the earth. So new rules. Um, now, now we've got the Isaiah 2 rules. All the nations are streaming uh, to, to the mountain um, and they don't have to leave their identity, ethnic identities at home. There's a lot of other uh, things that Paul says here, um, but Paul's foundational claim here is that what has made this possible, this transformation, is the faith in Christ or of Christ. Uh, if you turn back to Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse uh, uh, 16, um, you know, we know that a person is justified, and this word justified is a big important word in Judaism and in Christianity, but uh, uh, this uh, term here, as it's used in the Greek, um, to be justified really is to kind of be set right, to be um, to be uh, righteousified, um, to be made righteous. So uh, h- how is it that a person has been set right with God? Um, uh, we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, this is a, a Greek phrase, pistu Christa, Christos, um, the, the faith um, of Christ. Uh, this is a genitive. Um, so if I say like, uh, that's uh, the car of me, uh, you know, I might, that means that's my car, right? That's the possessive genitive, right? So this genitive construction, we can have either a subjective or an objective gen. Now you didn't know you're going to get a grammar lesson today, did you? Um, but this is really important. So the subjective or the objective genitive, is it the faith? Is it my faith in Christ? Is it the faith of Christ will save you? That means my faith about Christ will save me. Or is it the faith of Christ will save me? Christ's faith. That is the faithfulness of Christ who has loved himself and has loved me and given himself for me, which is what Paul says. Uh, So the argument there is the faith in Christ. That can be translated either way. So if you look at um, verse 16, and we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ. And there's, you might have a little translational note. That translational note might say, or the faith of Christ. That's a translational dispute. Now, my argument, what I think is right, is that I think this is the faith of Christ, Christ's faith, so that we might be justified by Christ's faith and not doing the works of the law. That is, Christ's faithfulness has justified me, not my faith in Christ. My faith in Christ comes as a result of Christ's faith in me and Christ's faithfulness to God on my behalf. And the reason I believe that is because uh, verse, verses 20 and 21 uh, just just a couple verses down where Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, or the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Christ loved me and gave himself for me. That's what he means by the life of the faith of the Son of God. That doesn't sound like what I'm doing. <laughs> it sounds like something that God is doing. So that's how I understand this argument, is that Paul's saying Christ's faithfulness has done the work of justification for me. I don't need the law for that. The law worked for a while for a certain community, for the Jewish community, to do these kinds of kinds of things. And the law is fine. Uh, it's, it's good. But if you want to go the route of the law, you have to fully commit to the route of the law. And that means you got to really become a Jew. And then you have to do all the things that a Jewish believer would do. But it seems that these Judaizers, according to what we can understand from Paul, these Judaizers were like halfway right? They were half in. Uh, they were <clears throat> telling people you, you got you to gotta get circumcised, but then like, I don't know, were they even telling people to do much after that? Um, it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, it seems like they might have said that may, that, that then sets you free. Uh, Paul has this whole argument in chapters five and six about freedom, and it seems that uh, people were living two free lives. Um, that is, uh, Paul saying you were set free in order to love and, 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 and live in Christ, um, uh, but uh, in, you weren't just set free, like set free, set free to do whatever you wanted. Um, so it might be that that these Judaizers actually were telling people, hey, like, get circumcised, and then you can kind of do whatever you want. Now, these might be different people who are saying these things, like two groups of, of people that Paul's I'm upset at, but all to say, um, it's uh, 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 it, it, the situation um, where Paul is saying Jews are bad. Um, Paul is not talking about Jews here. Paul is talking about Gentile people and what Gentile people are supposed to do, what's what's required of them. Uh, and he is not talking about Pharisees here. He's, he, Paul himself thinks he's a Pharisee. He thinks he's a great Pharisee. Um, uh, instead, he's uh, talking about uh, Judaizers. Uh, uh, so followers of Jesus um, who tell Gentiles that if they want to be followers of Jesus, they have to submit to the rituals uh, and um, uh, outward marks of Judaism. 
So, uh, again, for Paul's sake, Paul doesn't hate Jews. He is a Jew. He loves Jews. He's all in favor of Judaism. Um, what he's also in favor of is Gentiles joining Judaism through Jesus in a very particular way, that is, by retaining their ethnic identity, but also in uh, falling in love uh, with God through the work of Jesus. Um, so this would then lead to some ethical uh, changes and differences and so on, and that's a bit of what Paul talks about, the fruits of the Spirit. How can you tell that this, is, this transformation has happened? How can you tell that the, the blessing has gone out to the nations of the earth? Well, we're going to start to act differently. We're going to live our lives in a different way, and not according to the details of the Jewish law. Um, these Gentiles are going to start to live their lives according to the fruits of the Spirit, like joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and so on. Um, so that is a bit of what Paul is upset about. Uh, so uh, all to say, um, there is a bit of... Uh, troublesome, uh, difficult, um, uh, worrying uh, exegesis here that has to do with Hagar and Sarah. Um, I'm going to be honest and say that uh, chapter 4 verses uh, 21 uh, through 31 uh, or, or, or chapter 5 verse 1 um, weigh heavily on my heart um, as someone who looks at the story of Hagar, a slave woman, and, and she's kind of um, denigrated uh, in the story uh, of Paul. If you read Genesis uh, chapter 16, um, Hagar is a hero and uh, a saint of the faith. Um, uh, she has faith when everyone has abandoned her, uh, faith that God will see her through uh, in moments uh, of crisis, um, and she has been nothing but maltreated her whole life, um, uh, at least we can tell from the text. Um, so all to say, uh, this uh, uh, Paul at sometimes um, interprets these stories, and you can tell that he's doing this contextually uh, to try to get mad and, and, and really undo the exegesis of these biblical interpretation of these uh, Judaizers. Um, uh, but uh, if you read the allegory of Hagar and Sarah and come out of it thinking that Paul is being a bit flippant about uh, uh, about slavery and about um, the experience of people who uh, have lived in slavery, um, you might be right. Um, so all to say, uh, uh, that's that's part of a uh, part of what we get with Paul is we get Paul, we get his his real way of reading scripture and understanding and interpreting and so on um, and. Uh, uh, it's okay for us to in some way say that might have been working for the Galatian Christians uh, or the followers of Jesus in Galatia, um, but, uh, but that's not something that we need to necessarily uh, worry about ourselves. Uh, so uh, in any event, um, uh, I, as I mentioned, uh, Paul uh, uh, talks about at the very end of his letter how he's writing in his big hands. I love this, chapter 6, verse 11. See what large letters I make when I'm writing in my own hand. Uh, this probably is because he's not terribly skilled at being an actual papyrus writing scribe, um, which was actually a very difficult task. Um, uh, but, or it could be because he really wanted them to get this point. But he says, uh, it is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who try to compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Um, Paul makes a big point in this last little bit when he writes with his own hand. Um, he says, uh, you don't need to get things cut off. And in fact, he makes a joke in chapter 5, verse 12. Um, he kind of wishes that the people who, who are talking about having to cut yourself um, in order to become a member of Jesus' family, that is the people who are talking about circumcision, he says, I wish the knife would slip and they would, uh, they would just cut it, cut it all off kind of a bad joke that Paul makes there in chapter 5 verse 12. You got to imagine that the scribe might have said, "Oh, are you sure you want to you sure you want to write that?" Um, but Paul makes another kind of joke but a uh, poignant joke about being cut here. Um, and he says uh, in verse 16 of chapter 6, as for those who will follow this rule, oh sorry, in verse 15, for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is, is anything, but a new creation is everything. Um, uh, and then he says in verse 17, from now on, let no one make trouble for me, for I carry the marks of Jesus branded on my body. Um, he talks about his own suffering in this letter too. That is to say, um, he's been cut for the gospel. Um, but it's not the cut of circum. I mean, he's been circumcised when he was a baby. But uh, the point is that uh, uh, he's got different kinds of cuts now that represent um, this, the suffering that he's been through for the gospel. Um, uh, so this arguing about uh, other kinds of cuts um, uh, is, in a way, he says, uh, extraneous. Um, uh, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, uh, he says in verse 15. That is to say, he's not anti-circumcision. He just doesn't care. Like, why, why you know, it's, it's a great thing for Jewish families to go through. Um, it's a great mark of inclusion in the Jewish community, etc. But why would you tell uh, Galatian people to do this, right? Uh, these Celtic people living in Asia Minor, um, speaking Greek. Uh, there's no reason to do this. And it, all it would do is try to make it, like, what Paul is really trying to say, I think, is um, it just distracts. It's a distraction from the actual work of the gospel um, to focus on these minor uh, issues of um, ethnic inclusion, identity, and so on, um, uh, to try to force people into your ethnicity uh, or something like that, or force people into someone else's ethnicity, um, and not just recognize each other for who we are. We're different people. Um, and to even celebrate that. 
um, and as that that and the marks that we have on us uh, that that we're going to bear that we're going to want to actually show each other and to care about are kind of like those marks that Jesus has right the marks for the sake of the gospel um, that we bear on us um, uh, and another point um, uh, you know Paul says that uh, that there is no um, uh, there are really no differences between people. So in chapter 3, verse 27, as many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, there is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no, there is no Jew nor Gentile. There is no slave or free. There is no longer male nor female. All of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now, of course, there were still slaves and free people in the Roman Empire. That didn't go away with Jesus. And it didn't even go away in the Christian community. We'll talk about this when we talk about Philemon. Slavery exists. Um, but what Paul is saying is in the eyes of God, uh, that there is no distinction uh, between these people anymore because this new age, this radical new age has come where uh, the Gentiles are now clothing themselves in Christ, the perfect the perfect Jewish man, right, according to Paul. Um, so uh, uh, the, this is kind of uh, uh, all, it's a leveler of all identities. Now there's a new, instead of dividing the world up into all these different uh, identities um, uh, and, 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 and the arrangements of power that come along with them, instead Jesus brings a new possibility for identity that cuts through all of them uh, and opens up a new possibility for existence. So this is, uh, this is Paul's letter to the Galatians. Um, we'll come back to some of these issues of the law, uh, particularly in the law and freedom uh, when we talk about Romans. Um, when, when Paul tries to defend himself against those who would undo uh, his gospel a different way. Um, and uh, next week, we'll talk about uh, Corinthians, uh, First and Second Corinthians. I'll focus on First Corinthians. We'll have a short bit on Second Corinthians, but I look forward to sharing that with you all then. Uh, peace be with you. Uh, please let me know if I can do these things in a different way that would be more helpful, less helpful. Um, but I look forward to being with you all, uh, virtually if not uh, in person, and in person again someday soon.